I'm going to now cover the management of high and a relatively new concept of ultra high risk uh, disease in trophoblastic tumors. So uh, as you've seen this scoring uh, table already, uh, you know that there's the low risk group, but there's also a high risk group which is scoring uh, over six, so that's seven and above. And more recently, we've realized that patients that score 13 and above are ultra high risk. So what do I mean by ultra high risk? What's the difference between ordinary high risk and ultra high risk other than the scoring difference? So regular high risk disease, those patients, when you start the chemotherapy up, don't appear to have any risk of dying early within the first four weeks, whereas those patients who are scoring 13 or more seem to have an increased risk of dying early within the first four weeks of uh, your starting chemotherapy. Also, there is a difference in what happens later on in the ordinary high risk there's no um, real risk of a late death from multi-drug resistant disease, whereas in the ultra high risk group, there is an increased risk of developing drug resistant disease. So what might be associated with this other than the FIGO score? Well, it turns out that an interval more than 2.8 years is associated with having um, ultra high risk disease. Um, the presence of liver metastases either alone or in combination with brain metastases is a particularly poor risk feature. The Chinese have produced some data to suggest that renal metastases may also be a poor risk factor. And any patient presenting with just generalized very advanced disease, so lungs largely replaced with tumor and in respiratory failure should be regarded as ultra high risk. So what are these patients dying of early on? They're dying of bleeding, they're dying of metabolic problems as you start to treat the tumor, they get metabolic acidosis. So those are the usual causes of death in the first four weeks. So how can you avoid these early deaths in these ultra high risk patients? Well, um, we produced some data some years ago to show that starting on more gentle induction chemotherapy with etoposide 100 milligrams per meter squared on day one and day two, and cisplatin 20 milligrams per meter squared on day one and two, repeated if necessary weekly, up to three lots of the treatment, tends to avoid all these um, deaths from ultra high risk disease in the first four weeks of admission. And once the patient is clinically better, then you just get on with the chemotherapy uh, that they will need. So, well, how do patients present? And the answer is patients with high risk disease can present in just about any way you care to imagine. This lady, the left hand picture shows the upper gum margin with a rather vascular lesion in the gum. The patient thought she had an abscess and went to her dentist. The dentist looked at it and said, this doesn't look like an abscess, you need to go and see the oral surgeon. And as she was getting out of the dental chair, she fainted and they called an ambulance. She recovered before the ambulance arrived and said, I'm feeling fine, I'm going to go home. And they said, no, the ambulance is now here. Please go to the hospital. So she went and when she arrived, they of course did an electrical recording of the heart, which was normal. And then they wanted to do a chest X-ray in a lady with a collapse. And uh, before they did that, they did a pregnancy test, which was positive. And this then led to a whole series of other investigations and to cut a long story short, she had brain metastases, multiple lung metastases, the metastasis you see in the gum margin, she had liver metastases, pancreatic metastases, renal metastases, nothing in the uterus, and uh, a very elevated HCG. And with chemotherapy, all was well.
So the moral of the story is any woman of childbearing age presenting with unexplained looking vascular lesions or unexplained metastases always measure the HCG because you may save her life. And the image on the right shows that the chemotherapies made that lesion disappear. And indeed, all of her other disease disappeared. So it follows that you need a broad range of investigations when you see somebody with a suspected um, choriocarcinoma. And uh, so it's CT chest and abdomen, MRI brain and pelvis, and if you're suspicious of disease in the spine, then MRI of the spine. Doppler ultrasound of the pelvis can sometimes add something to what you get out of an MRI pelvis. Uh, we still measure the CSF HCG to serum HCG ratio on a lumbar puncture if the MRI brain is normal in someone with metastatic choriocarcinoma, just in case we may be missing something. The ratio should be 1 to 60 or less. Um, FDG PET scanning isn't particularly helpful at the beginning, but may be helpful later on when you're looking for which bit of drug-resistant disease should I remove first. Notice that biopsy is not mandatory. In fact, if you biopsy somebody where you can't control the bleeding site, you may make them bleed to death. And you heard that already in Leon's talk. Genetics may be important um, because if you um, uh, aren't sure whether this is a lung cancer that uh, has just turned on a choriocarcinoma appearance, um, but in fact is a lung cancer, you could do the genetics and show that it is non-gestational. So, how should you treat the regular high-risk patient? Well, Emico is a widely uh, used regimen around the world, and this just describes what it is. Uh, it's an overnight stay one week and an outpatient treatment the second week, so it's a weekly alternating schedule of treatment. It is intensive. Uh, patients will need GCSF support, uh, that's granulocyte colony stimulating factor support, each week while they're on treatment to maintain treatment intensity. So how are we doing with this treatment? Well, this slide shows you uh, an updated series from uh, 2013. And the blue line, the middle line, is the high-risk patients. That includes the ultra-high-risk as well as the regular high-risk. And you'll see that about 94, 95% of patients are achieving long-term survival. Now, that isn't all achieved on the basis of MRCO because 20% of patients will relapse and they will need salvaging. The top line... The green line are the low-risk patients who failed on low-risk treatment with single-agent therapy and or actinomycin D salvage therapy, and so went on to Emico. We quote normally 100% survival, but the very sharp-eyed amongst you will see that one death occurred about seven and a half years out, and that was not because of trophoblastic disease. This was a woman who couldn't stop smoking and developed a lung cancer. So the other curve that you see there, the one that falls to zero survival, are the ones that we thought were choriocarcinomas of gestational origin, but when we did the genetics, they were non-gestational, the lung cancers, the gastric cancers. So not surprising that we don't cure them. So how do we salvage the Emico failures? Well, this is an old regimen developed by my colleague Ed Newlands some years ago when we realized that cisplatin was a very active agent. This is another weekly alternating treatment, but notice that the second day of the Emma is omitted. So there's no day two of etoposide and actinomycin D. This is a really toxic therapy. Very close attention is required to the marrow function and renal function. And many patients, after some weeks of being on this treatment, can't take it anymore. So we need a less toxic therapy. And so in um, the mid-90s, I developed this treatment, which is a Taxol and Cisplatin regimen alternating every two weeks with Taxol and Atoposide. 
And I'm not going to show you the, combined, the uh, toxicity data, but this is much less toxic than epema, so we don't see neutropenic sepsis, whereas we do frequently with epema. Um, and just to summarize, both epema and TETP in non-randomized retrospective analyses show that they salvage between 75 to 80% of EMACO failures, but the TETP looks less toxic. There are a variety of other salvage regimens used. So in China, this 5-fluorouracil uh, containing FAEV multidrug regimen is very popular uh, and very active. Um, it, uh, 5-FU doesn't go down terribly well in the Western population, so we've tried it and it's much more toxic. Uh, and I think this is due to the way we metabolize things in our Western populations compared to the way the Chinese metabolize 5-FU. Those familiar with germ cell tumors will recognize the BEP regimen, the TIP regimen, and even GEM-TIP, which have all been tried in various uh, practices and all have activity. Um, but bear in mind that bleomycin adds quite some toxicity and probably isn't a very active uh, drug in the management of GTM. So, um, what about the concept of high-dose chemotherapy? If your standard treatment is working well but isn't quite well enough to get the patients to remission, maybe what you need to do is to give much, much bigger doses of the treatment, which would normally kill the patient, but uh, because you destroy the bone marrow, but you normally store some bone marrow in the freezer before you give the high-dose chemotherapy. And then once that high dose is gone, you reinfuse the bone marrow back for the patient. And this salvages about 40% of patients, either directly in about 20-22% or indirectly with other treatment in the remainder of cases. Uh, there are a number of other drugs that are active, gemcitabine, pemetrexid, and capcitabine. Um, surgery should not be forgotten, and uh, you already heard that from the end massacre, how useful this can be. Uh, radiotherapy may also be uh, useful, particularly if you've got focal disease in the brain left after chemotherapy, not suitable for removal by surgery, then some stereotactic or gamma knife treatment to that area can be helpful. I'm not an advocate of whole brain radiotherapy because remember these are young women and you're going to add significantly to their long-term toxicity if you do whole brain radiotherapy. And if you compare non-randomized data from the US with our own data, their US data achieves no better long-term survival for brain disease than our own data, where we don't give whole brain radiotherapy. So, high dose experience. We've just updated it and published it this year. 32 patients treated mainly with carboplatin, etoposide, cyclophosphamide, and paclitaxel. 22 patients had single rounds of high dose and 10 had a double procedure. A median of, of three previous lines of treatment, so these were heavily pretreated patients. 13 have been uh, alive in remission. And if we look at whether they had a previous diagnosis of choriocarcinoma or a PSTT or ETT, it's very similar, uh, the proportion of patients who appear to go into remission. But I emphasize that not all of these patients achieved remission from the high dose alone. A number of them required additional treatment, including surgical removal of residual disease sites. So this just shows you an example of surgical salvage. This was a lady who was originally a low-risk choriocarcinoma post-term. And you'll see that she's had multiple rounds of treatment with failures and further treatment, including a tandem transplant. And then after that, she still relapses. And uh, you'll see that we then did multiple thoracotomies to remove bits of active disease, plus gave her some additional chemotherapy, which we haven't yet published, a regimen of escalated etoposide and cisplatin given every two weeks. 500 milligrams per meter squared of cisplatin and 60 milligrams per meter squared, uh, sorry, 500 milligrams per meter squared of etoposide and 60 milligrams per meter squared of cisplatin every two weeks. 
uh, and the patient's HCG normalized, but there was still a residual lesion left in the lung on the far hand side of the graph on the right side. So she had a thoracotomy, and that removed active choriocarcinoma. Uh, the things that she had in the brain all disappeared on the escalated EP, but there was a small hole left, so we gave that some stereotactic radiotherapy. And this was all back in 2009, and she remains well to date. Um, so that's a success story uh, following a failure of high dose and how we achieved it. Okay, so other salvage approaches. What about the new agents? Well, these tumors uh, do express the epidermal growth factor receptor. Um, we've never been able to demonstrate any mutations in these receptors, uh, so it's not like lung cancer. But we have treated them uh, with allotinib or gefitinib for several patients and seen no responses. These are very vascular tumors, so you might therefore think that an antivascular agent such as bevacizumab might work. We've tried it in a couple of patients and seen no response. Um, they make HCG. So why not try an anti-HCG-based therapy or a vaccine? Many years ago, um, Ken Bagshaw, who first started running the UK service, um, radio-labeled an HCG antibody uh, with radioactive iodine and treated one multidrug-resistant patient successfully. But we've never repeated this. We no longer have access to this sort of therapy. So I have no idea whether this would be a valid ongoing approach. There are other uh, vascular markers on these tumors, including endoglin, and there is an anti-endoglin antibody available. Uh, so that has been tried in combination with bevacizumab now in six patients, one of whom responded and is in remission. And the case report of that was in gynae oncology in 2018. These tumors are derived from trophoblast. Trophoblast evades the immune system because if it didn't, uh, none of us would be here today and none of us would succeed in having our own children. So how does that happen? Well, one of the mechanisms by which trophoblast evades the immune system is by the expression of PDL1, program death ligand 1. And many of you will know about the checkpoint immunotherapies. And so we wondered whether these might be active. So here is a lady who had um, ultra high risk disease. She commenced our low dose etoposide and cisplatin treatment on the left hand side of the graph. And you'll see that uh, we then got going with EP Emma chemotherapy because she had uh, liver and brain disease. And you'll see that her HCG normalized on this treatment. There was then a relapse, the middle hump on the graph, and um, she had further chemotherapy and a tandem transplant. She then went into remission, the second bit of flat line, and then her HCG rose again. And at this point, she had disease in her liver and in her lungs. So she went on to have more treatment with our escalated etoposide and cisplatin regimen, and she had a partial response to this, but didn't normalize her HCG. And in fact, it started to rise. So we then gave her gem tip chemotherapy. And this is the patient who told me that gem tip was even worse than high dose chemotherapy. And so at this point, we were running out of options. So we put her on pembrolizumab, the agent that binds to PD-1. Kytruda is its uh, a, a common name. And uh, you'll see that on pembrolizumab, her HCG normalized, the liver lesions disappeared, her lung disease had gone, and uh, she has a, uh, a normal HCG. Now, all of this treatment finished in October of 2015, and we are today still without any sign of relapse. So she remains in a durable remission. This is different from lung cancer where you keep going with pembrolizumab for two years or melanoma where you don't know when to stop. Um, so that's interesting. 
So is it anecdote? And the answer is no. We've had seven out of 10 patients uh, who uh, appear to have been responders to pembrolizumab, including patients with placental site trophoblastic tumors and epithelioid trophoblastic tumors that have failed high-dose chemotherapy. Uh, there have been three non-responders. The non-responders uh, included a PSTT, an ETT, and a choriocarcinoma patient. So uh, can we tell who is going to respond and who is not? And the answer is, I don't know yet, but I can tell you all of the tumors were pdl one positive and strongly positive, so that is not going to be the way to select patients. Interestingly, the responders appear to have a lot of infiltrating lymphocytes, and we're starting to do a, a deep immunophenotyping of these cases, and it looks like CD8 T cells are important. Um, HLA class one and two are not expressed on these tumors, so you've got to ask yourself, how are the CD8 cells doing their job? Because normally you acquire class one and class two for them to work, and I don't know the answer to this. But what I can say is that HLA-G looked well expressed in the responders, but not in at least one of the non-responders. Uh, the non-responders also seem to have few infiltrating lymphocytes. So we're still trying to understand how to select patients. Uh, if this is working, and it's working in 70% of our no-hoper cases, what about combination immunotherapy? Those of you that treat melanoma will know that the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab is better than either agent alone. Uh, so maybe we should be thinking of combinations, but we have to then think about how you balance the toxicity because the combinations can be much more toxic than the uh, single agents. Uh, you've also got to think about the cost. These drugs are enormously expensive, even if you just give it for six months. So, and the other thing to bear in mind is how does this affect fertility? These drugs clearly break the fetomaternal barrier. Uh, so could it be that they'll hang around for years after the treatment and stop women getting pregnant? And we don't know the answer to this. So what about ultra high risk? Um, what can we tell you about that? Uh, low dose EP we've already talked about. It may be necessary in people with advanced brain disease that they're, where they've bled into their metastases that they might need neurosurgery at the start of treatment, or they might need a skull flap raise to allow the brain, as it swells with chemotherapy, to bulge upwards rather than downwards through the foramen magnum. Uh, there may be a requirement for embolization of bleeding lesions. The treatment will need to be adapted for brain disease, so we give um, an increased dose of methotrexate in the EMA regime, which is at a gram per meter squared rather than at 300 milligrams per meter squared. You might think about giving intrathecal methotrexate with the CO or with the EP side of the regime. Uh, for people who've got liver and brain disease, we now prefer EP-EMA as opposed to uh, EMA-CO. Uh, and then how long should you consolidate for? In regular high risk, we consolidate for six weeks, but in ultra high risk disease, we consolidate for eight weeks. Do we really know whether this is important? No, this is a gut feeling, and this is what we've been doing. Um, we've already mentioned stereotactic radiotherapy for residual brain disease, not suitable for neurosurgery. We've talked about avoiding whole brain radiotherapy. So, let's talk about a case. This was a 29-year-old uh, nurse. She just had a healthy baby, her first baby, and after the delivery, she felt rather tired. Not uncommon, but she also was a bit dizzy, and she had a numb patch on her thigh, and she was continuing to bleed. So, 15 days later, her husband came home to find her unconscious in their living room. And so he called an ambulance and she was admitted to the local hospital where she was found to be afebrile, very tachycardic, very short of breath and had a normal blood pressure. She was found to be in respiratory failure and they started ventilation. 
Her CT scan showed uh, multiple lung metastases, liver metastases, a pancreatic uh, mass, a large vascular uterus, and the brain on CT looked normal. So her HCG was 120,000. Is a biopsy required? Does anybody think? No, absolutely. No biopsy needed. Correct. So this shows you her imaging. Her lungs full of metastases. There's a liver met, one of them. Uh, you can see the pancreatic met on this one. And there's her big vascular uterus. So nasty situation. So she was transferred as an emergency by ambulance to our hospital on ventilation. Her FIGO score was 20. Her MRI of the brain when she arrived with us showed metastases in the brain. So missed on the CT, which shows you why MRI is better than CT. The MRI also picked up a bone metastasis in her right humerus. Uh, it was Saturday night, and it was Saturday night. What treatment are you going to give her? Any offers? Emma Cope. No, low-dose CP. Low-dose low dose etoposide and cisplatin. Yeah, that's it. So in the old days, we would have done exactly what you said, Emma Co. Um, we were killing patients doing that. So that's why we gave this lady now low dose etoposide and cisplatin. Unfortunately, we didn't kill her. So that was good. Um, and um, the other thing that we did was we tried to get her extubated. Our clinical experience of people who come on ventilation is that if you don't get them off the ventilator quickly, the positive pressures used to ventilate the lungs breaks the very friable blood vessels in the tumors in the lungs, and then they bleed out in the lungs, and they're dead. So we managed to persuade our brave intensive care doctor to take the tube out. We managed her head down so the blood could come out of her lungs and onto the floor, and um, uh, over the coming 24, 48 hours with the chemotherapy, her breathing rate improved, her saturations, which were about 85% or 100% oxygen, improved. And eventually, three days later, we could have a proper conversation with her. And uh, so then she switched to the EP-EMMA regime that you see here, adapted because of the brain disease and with intrathecal methotrexate with the um, EP side of the regimen. And you can see her HCG normalized and in the end, um, uh, she went into remission. At the end of the treatment, we finished with paclitaxel and etoposide because she could no longer tolerate the EP-EMMA. It was just too much for her bone marrow. Eight weeks of consolidation. What about the baby? Should we be worried about the baby? Anybody think we should be worried? Well, I think we should. Neonatal choriocarcinoma is rare. So just because it happens in the mum doesn't mean it can't happen in the baby. It can cross into the baby. It typically presents within six months. And it usually presents in the baby before the mother. Um, so always check the infant's urine HCG. We do it just once. If it's normal, then we don't want to worry the parents, and we just say if there's some problem, baby's failing to thrive, please bring the baby back and we'll recheck them. So it's a happy ending. She then got married some months later, and uh, that's the causative baby in her arms. And you'll be glad to know that a couple of years later, she had another baby. So it was a very happy ending. So when to reset residual masses? Uh, Leon briefly touched on this, but low risk disease, we don't normally do any resection of residual masses. We've not found them to be predictive of recurrence. High risk disease, we're not quite sure. If you have a very large mass left after treating high risk, um, we then re remove it. PET is not reliable. You get false positives and false negatives. Um, the PSTTs and ETTs, which we're going to talk about in a moment, all of those need removing. So what do we do when the patient comes to us six weeks after the end of treatment for their final visit? Well, we repeat any abnormal imaging to see what's left. 
Uh, we give them standard advice about sun exposure. The chemotherapy sensitizes the skin to UV radiation for about a year. We talk to them about when to have future pregnancies. And usually we say, if they can, wait six months to 12 months. Uh, contraception, they can have any type of contraception that suits them. We talk to them about the risk of relapse and the importance of HCG monitoring. And we mention the fact that we know that some patients get psychosexual problems. You've heard about um, uh, this data from Matt. This was the raw data that underpins it. And you can see that for low risk patients, uh, the latest relapse happens at seven years. And it is also true for high risk patients. The latest relapse happens at seven years. So in the UK, we stop monitoring the regular patients at this time. So I think I'm going to skip over this because you've heard all about this from Matt. Uh, just to say that second cancers, even in combination agent chemotherapy, is zero, providing you keep it to less than six uh, months of treatment. So high-risk GTA and overall survival, you can expect 95%. Biopsy, not mandatory. Emico is widely used. Ultra high risk is if the FIGO score is 13 or above. And there are various things that you then need to consider. You need to adapt the treatment for CNS disease. We've talked about salvage, high dose surgery, and I think high dose is going to be replaced by immunotherapy. So um, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and um, thank the organizers again. Do you want me to move straight on to the next talk, Eleanor? Or has somebody got a burning question? Yep. Somebody's got a question. Здравствуйте. Скажите, пожалуйста. Good day. Uh... Uh, do you usually uh, use uh, uh, tackle metatroxate with metastasis in brain? Always um, intratecal. Yes, so uh, it has been our standard practice to give intrathecal methotrexate in the presence of brain metastases. Where, whether this is really new needed, I cannot say, and I know that some centers don't do it. Um, so we do it until the HCG is normal in the CSF, and then we stop giving the intrathecal methotrexate. Um, so Sheffield, for example, doesn't give intrathecal methotrexate, uh, but does also give the increased dose of methotrexate with the EMMA, so a gram per meter yes. squared. And at the moment, they don't have any different results from ourselves. So we're just doing a comparison of our data sets to see whether or not it may be possible to stop doing the intrathecal methotrexate. OK, thank you. Who would you recommend to test for PDL expression? Routinely or not? Or so for PDL one um, staining, you will find probably nearly every single tumor that you look at will be positive. So this won't be a selection biomarker to help you know which patients to give it to. Um, so uh, we only do it in the patients where we're thinking about giving pembrolizumab. So if your question is, who should we give pembrolizumab to? Well, I think as time moves on, we will probably be wanting to use pembrolizumab, maybe even for the elderly patients uh, with, who are going to get Emma Co. So ordinary high risk, maybe we would like to start using it then. I would never want to give it in low risk disease because we have very cheap, very effective uh, drugs to treat this, which don't affect fertility. Um, I'm slightly hesitant about bringing the pembrolizumab too close to the beginning of treatment in women who want to get pregnant. We don't have data. So I think if we're OK, we'll go to the next talk. So thank you. Um, so placental site trophoblastic tumors and epithelial trophoblastic tumors are 
really the rarest variety of trophoblastic tumors. And you already saw this slide presented earlier from Matt. And just to remind you that this new entity, atypical placental site nodules, and probably even the non-atypical placental site nodules, can either be associated with or go on to develop PSTTs or ETTs. And this probably happens in 10 to 15% of cases. So it makes it a bit difficult to know how you should manage uh, the women who have atypical placental site nodules. So what about PSTT and ETT? Well, compared to choriocarcinoma, it's much more slow growing. It tends to metastasize later in its natural history. Lymph node involvement is more common. It's less chemosensitive, but that doesn't mean to say it doesn't respond to chemotherapy. Uh, it arises from intermediate trophoblast, uh, and it tends to make less HCG for the volume of disease. So it's possible to see cases where there's lots of disease and the HCG is normal. So how does it present? Uh, often not so dissimilar from choriocarcinoma. Uh, Two-thirds will have vaginal bleeding. Um, uh, just over a quarter will have abdominal pain or a disruption of menstrual periods. Uh, and then there are a whole variety of other things that can happen depending on where the disease is presenting. So um, how do you investigate? Well, rather like choriocarcinoma, you need a broad range of investigations. So nothing different here, except histopathology is mandatory. You can't make this diagnosis without having pathology. Um, and genetics is really important here because you want to confirm whether this is really gestational or as Matt said, it could be a squamous carcinoma that just looks a bit like an ETT. Um, and it's also important to do the genetics to know which is the causative pregnancy. So the management before 2007, uh, if it was localized, then hysterectomy was the treatment of choice. And then there was an indecision as to whether or not chemotherapy was necessary. Um, and if it was a first ever pregnancy, there was some concern that you would like to preserve fertility, could you get away with just a focal resection, a modified Strasman procedure where you repair the uterus and just remove the affected bit? Um, and for metastatic disease, uh, chemotherapy was the treatment of choice, uh, followed by surgery to remove the uterus and any other known residual disease sites. So, the sorts of treatment used were EMACO or EPEMA, and then in relapse, EPEMA or TETP, and uh, sometimes high dose chemotherapy. Uh, at the time we did this analysis and published it in The Lancet in 2009, we'd had a 70% 10 year overall survival uh, with 62 cases. So, small case numbers, and this was the largest series at the time 14 deaths. And the main thing that distinguished who was going to die was this, the interval between when you were diagno uh, diagnosed and the causative pregnancy. And if you were more than four years out, all of the patients, even if they were originally stage one, died. Whereas if you were less than 48 months, even if you had very advanced metastatic disease, all but one of these patients became long-term survivors. So this was a phenomenal predictive signal uh, which made us change management. And so what we decided was that any patient presenting more than 48 months out from their causative pregnancy, regardless of stage, would be offered intensive chemotherapy and the possibility of having high-dose chemotherapy. So. We did a new study now to analyze where we are with the modified treatment. And we looked at a range of prognostic factors, looked at the treatments that were used, and we screened our UK database. So this is the whole of the United Kingdom um, for all the patients with PSTT, ETT. And we compared the old cohort with the new cohort. Uh, to see whether or not our new treatments were make, making a difference. And just to show you that at the time we did this, we had 54,743 trophoblastic disease cases registered, 
125 were PSTTs or ETTs. So um, it's only a small fraction of the total uh, GTD database. And this just shows you a comparison between the old and the new and the, all, all the patients, showing you that uh, things were fairly similar between the two groups uh, and uh, that there was uh, similar numbers of patients who were more than 48 months or less than 48 months out. So, uh, and stage one disease, again, similar numbers between the old and the new cohort. So, in terms of metastatic sites, lungs were the commonest, pelvic lymph nodes were the next most common, and liver the next most common. Right, so, uh, did the different treatment approach affect, uh, uh, were there differences in the way we treated these two cohorts? Um, and uh, you'll see that uh, there was a bit more primary surgery in the later cohort compared to the older cohort. Uh, you'll see that there are more people having uh, TAHs in the new cohort compared to the old cohort. Uh, so, um, and otherwise, what about the chemotherapy? And there's a dramatic difference here. There's much more platinum containing chemotherapy in the new cohort compared to the old. So the use of Emico really is disappeared between the old cohort and the new cohort. And you'll notice that there's much more high dose chemotherapy given in the new cohort compared to the old. So how are we doing for survival? Well, in the old cohort, our overall survival at 10 years was 70%. Uh, the new analysis combining new and old was 75%. So it looks like we might be doing better. Um, and if you look at what was prognostic on univariate analysis, you'll see that um, uh, things that uh, uh, came out um, were a variety of things, age, uh, time since antecedent pregnancy, stage, HCG level, and the mitotic count, but some things didn't uh, turn out to be significant, invasion and the type of, uh, uh, whether they had chemotherapy or surgery, um, uh, sorry, the type of treatment was important, but the invasion wasn't. So. If you look at multivariable analysis, uh, once again, the interval is the most important thing. But you'll notice now that the curve doesn't drop to zero. There are some people with more than 48 months out who are actually living. And you'll also see stage is now important, and particularly stage four disease is an independent poor prognostic factor. So if you now look at a stage um, and how it affects survival and whether it is more or less than 48 months out, for stage one disease, if you were more than um, 48 months out, five of nine patients in the whole series died, which means that four of nine are alive. Less than 48 months, uh, all of those patients are alive. Stage three, again, uh, less than 48 months, all are alive, but more than 48 months, uh, nine of 10 have died, and this is the total series, remember. And uh, for stage four, now there's a very clear effect that for stage four, even less than 48 months, you'll see that some patients are dying. So this is why stage four is an independent prognostic factor and why stage three might not be so important as an independent prognostic factor. So if you now look specifically at the patients who were more than 48 months out and compare the first cohort with the second cohort, you'll remember in the first cohort, all 13 patients died. In the new cohort, nine of 17 patients are in remission. That's good. So the question is, is why is that? And you'll see that there is a significant increase in the amount of high dose chemotherapy given in the new cohort to these patients compared to the old cohort. So it's, I'd like to put it to you that the reason why we're doing better is we're treating these patients much more aggressively with more platinum based chemotherapy and with high dose chemotherapy. Of course, the numbers are small. This could be just a chance thing that we're looking at, but we think that maybe actually it's the more intensive treatment.
What about ETT? Does it really behave like PSTT? Well, the best study to look at this has just been published um, uh, using the world database. 56 patients with ETT uh, in the world database. Um, and you'll see, again, the most important thing is the interval. More than 48 months, they do badly. Less than 48 months, they do well. And stage, again, is important. Stage two to four does worse than stage one. So it looks like ETT behaves rather similarly to PSTT, at least in this early analysis. So in conclusion, uh, prognosis more than uh, 48 months um, uh, um, the, or a FI is, is, is the worst thing. A FIGO stage uh, of four is also a poor prognostic factor, and that's probably much more significant than being FIGO stage three. Um, improved overall survival um, it appears to be happening now in those women more than 48 months from their causative uh, pregnancy, and this may be linked to increased treatment intensity. And this has led to this uh, algorithm of how to treat patients. And I just present this here as a sort of summary slide, which you can have afterwards to digest at your, uh, to your heart's content. I just want to briefly say something about um, uh, we mentioned the high days, but to say something about the immunotherapy, again, we've been using immunotherapy in this population, and it is active. It doesn't work for everybody, but it is active. And I wonder whether this won't be the way to go to avoid the high-dose treatment, which is so much more toxic than the immunotherapy. Um, what about fertility conservation? This is really a big issue for young women, first ever pregnancy, and it ends up as a PSTT or ETT. Is there something we can do for these women? I think the answer is yes, potentially, but it has to be viewed as experimental. So there have been a number of cases where we've done focal resection, and others have done the same thing in China. And there are now reports of these women having babies, but we also have problems with multifocal microscopic disease in the uterus that you can't appreciate until you take the whole uterus out. So you remove the focal bit and you don't see the other little bits that are scattered around in the rest of the uterus, and that's a problem. So patients who go in for this modified Strassman procedure need to understand that this is an experimental process. It isn't the recommended standard of care, but if it's something they want to try, they're, they're appraised of the fact that it may go badly wrong for them. So in summary, diagnosis pathology is essential. Prognostic markers um, are emerging. Um, and it's clear that being more than 48 months, some biological change happens in the tumor. Stage four is also a poor prognostic factor. But remember, the numbers are still small. And as we get more cases, we'll probably find new prognostic factors. Less than 48 months out, patients can be assured of an excellent outcome. Um, there may be other features such as mitosis that could become important in the future, the mitotic count. Um, the current recommended treatment, local disease, hysterectomy is the standard of care rather than focal resection. Uh, metastatic disease, we now favor EP-EMA plus resection of residual lesions. Um, and if it's more than 48 months or stage four, then more intensive treatment is going to be required, whether that's immunotherapy, high dose, high dose plus immunotherapy, and of course, surgery. Please remember that we have this international database, um, and if you have cases, we'd be delighted if you would register them with us, because that's the way we're going to learn more, all of us collectively, about this disease. So uh, I'd like to thank all of you very much for listening to me, and to also thank Fika Frerling, who did that analysis on the PSTTs and ETTs. Thank you.